Oh, perfect. Great. So, sorry for the hiccups. Uh, we're ready to start now. And um, yeah, this is new to me. I haven't been live streaming in a long time. And last time I've, I've done it uh, via Twitch. So YouTube, YouTube streaming is uh, something new for me. But thanks, thanks for joining the stream. And yeah, the idea today is just to give some kind of like official uh, announcement, official presentation of the second edition of the Practical FP in Scala, a hands-on approach book. And yeah, I, I hope uh, most of you read it or at least have it on your reading list or at least, or maybe you read the, the, the first edition and want to know what's new in this second edition and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So yeah, I'll be following the chat on my phone, see, and try to, to reply to, to any questions you may have. So yeah, so this is a book and uh, well, you can read a little bit about uh, the target audience uh, on Limpap, here's a link limpapcom slash pfp dash scala and it's a company and it's supplemented by two different projects this one and this one um, which we're gonna look into detail today we're gonna explore the the projects and you know i'll be happy to answer any questions and yeah so the table of contents is down here um, if you read the first edition you might notice that the the order of some of the of some of the ch chapters changed and this is basically uh, addressing feedback and things that I changed uh, that I wasn't very happy with the first edition or, or, or things that I you know I was okay but I think I could do better and and that's it this is the result right the second edition and great so yeah let's let's jump in let's try to uh, explore the book here so this is the second edition of the book right here and well we have the the table of context here um something that is very different in the in the second edition is that we uh the, the chapter number one is uh, best practices uh it's it, it was called uh basically how was it called it was called design patterns in the first edition and i renamed it to to best practices because um well it was not everything about design patterns there's also a, a, a few things like and anti-patterns and and also best practices and a few things that are very opinionated so uh, i think best practices uh, was a better name overall and so we're gonna we start the the book with this chapter because it's kind of like a preparation for what's to come for what we're gonna see in the in the rest of the book in the in, in the rest of in the other chapters um, chapter two is about uh, backless final encoding uh, it's like tiny introduction uh, about full of examples and at least explaining the this encoding in in a way that I, I like to to you know I in a way that I like to work with this encoding and a few things uh, about uh, modules and and a few comparisons like tactless why tactless final and we, so we talked a little bit about parametricity um, but in the end in the end of the day the decision is yours uh, both approaches using tactless final and using a concrete uh, effect type like io are valid um, but i the reason why in, in the book i recommend tactless final because i think it is much easier to teach junior members or like people with not so much experience in, in functional programming, it's easier to teach them to do the right thing when you are constrained, uh, when you have constrained parameters, constrained type class constraints, for example. Um, uh, but whenever you have IO, it's uh, obviously any anyone who is not very experienced will basically use any any function, any method uh, available in I/O, which is basically everything. Um, so that 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 was my take on on why I choose Tactics Final uh, for applications. Um, uh, so yeah, chapter three continues with the introduction of the of the business requirements because we uh, in this book we develop an application. It's called the shopping cart application, which we're gonna see soon. So basically start with the business requirements, identifying domain and HTTP endpoints, 
uh, talk a little bit about the technical stuff we, the, we, we are going to use in the rest of the book and then we continue with the business logic um, pure business logic is something that we could test that basically doesn't require uh, any effects we can we can deal with it in terms of uh, tactless algebras and and dsls <clears throat> so this is kind of like we create our, our own dsl our own language via these tactless final algebras or interfaces and and then we can just combine the different pieces just to to create to create a bunch of logic that we could unit test um, chapter five talks deeply about HTTP4S, um, which actually is a, the de facto HTTP framework um, in the type level ecosystem. Um, we yeah, basically see the server side, the client side, and in chapter six, we take a detour uh, to talk a little bit about type class derivation, which uh, it's a little bit, we use a, a new library called uh, the Revo in the second edition. Well, it's not a new library, but it's a new library in the in the second edition. <clears throat> um, so we don't go deep into this topic because it's like quite complex. But we we basically see only what it's needed for our application. We're gonna see that soon. Chapter seven goes talks a little bit about Skunk and Doofy and um, Redis for Cats. A little bit also about blocking operations and transact transactions. Um, chapter 8 is all dedicated to testing. In this second edition, we use the, the Weaver test framework. We're also going to talk about a little bit. Um, we talk about law testing and integration test, also HTTP, uh, routes and clients testing, which is super interesting. And yeah, chapter 9 and 10, it's a little bit about uh, basically putting all the application together, uh, which is something that a lot of uh, uh, People not with not so much uh, experience in, in creating and basically designing an application is like how to you know I I understand the IO monad for example or I understand how to combine effects together but how do I put all these pieces together when you are trying to create a big application and that's what I chapter nine tries to address and try tries to give some advice on that on that front and chapter ten talks about. Uh, how to create Docker images, a little bit about CI/CD, but without going into much details because um, yeah, it's a complex topic as well. And finally, there is a bonus chapter where we see a little bit of MTL and optics, uh, a little bit about Tofu library, which is very interesting. And um, yeah, in, in the end, I just focus mainly on, on FS2 and, and Cats Effect 3 because a lot of people asked about these two, two libraries and you know see more complex examples about concurrency and so I tried to produce a few um, a few interesting examples like a producer consumer like multiple subscriptions interruptions and server regions uh, state machines and so on so that's that's the end of the book it has about yeah overall about 300 pages almost um, and something that I, I'm, I'm quite proud of is that I put a lot of work into the, the new syntax. <laughs> um, this is all, was all kind of like very manual to get this done. I can share with you if you're interested in how uh, the book is basically rendered in the different formats, because this is, this is shipped as a PDF, but also uh, as an EPUB and the, the Kindle format, <coughs> and basically using Pandoc. Uh, but with a lot of customization and custom uh, latex templates so yeah there's a bunch of things here so okay like next I'd like to, to introduce you to the project uh, I mentioned that the, the book comes uh, supplemented with these two projects one, one is basically the uh, the shopping cart application which only acts as a guideline uh, so something that you could look into if you're lost but the recommendation is uh, basically follow, follow the book and try to, to write an application on your own because that's that's a way, the best way to, to learn. The best way to learn is basically write the application and try to bump into into issues and see how you solve them. Um, that's the only way you're gonna internalize the the, the knowledge. Uh, but as a reference, you can always look into the the. the this application here, um, it's 
it has this kind of like graphic of components which are like kind of like, kind of like spread around but basically explains the, the components of, of the application and yeah there's a bunch of instructions about how to run it how to run the unit test and what else and the other application is basically uh, pfps examples are the all the ex standalone examples um now uh, you will see in the book you'll find it in the book so everything uh, in the second edition i've been extra careful to not forget about uh, some examples and and not forget about some examples and just, like make sure that everything here compiles so uh, that that's one of the mistakes I, I committed in the in the first edition uh, some examples uh, did not uh, they, they were not uh, present in this project and that was my my mistake uh, but basically here we'll, we'll find uh, all, of, all of them you can check out the project run them uh, so I think that's pretty useful um, so yeah let's let's dive deep into the application and Well, yeah, someone commented about uh, issues with Docker on Mac. Unfortunately, that's uh, Docker on Mac. Uh, it's something that I can, it's out of my control. And so like, you'll need to ask help to Apple or Mac users. Uh, I don't use Mac. Um, so uh, I know that there are some issues always on, on, on Mac when it comes to run Docker and containers and Kubernetes and Nix and it's, yeah, I don't know why people use Mac at all. <laughs> anyway, um, let's look into uh, the project here. Uh, yes. uh, so um, let's start with main. Here's the entry point. Make it a little bit bigger so you can see. I always like to run SPT here. Uh, And the project on the side here. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So this is the application. Uh, let's look. This is the the main. The it's called main. Is the entry point. You can you can see that extends IO app simple. Um, let's look into the structure of the project first. Uh, so here is main. Main dot scala. You can see we have two different modules. One is called core, the other one is called test. Uh, here is main, and then we have a bunch of folders, directories here. And M1 for the win says Salar. Well, I, I agree, M1 is actually very promising. It, it's, uh, it's a very promising technology, but it, it's still quite raw, right? It, it doesn't work with a lot of things. Uh, but yeah that's something something great but i, I will never use it anyway <laughs> um someone is asking me what development tool you are using um this is basically neo vim is a text editor i use it for everything not only for scala just to to write the book to write uh, code in other languages to write notes for everything, but for Scala, it's basically um, I use uh, COC uh, and Vim and the uh, Metals. Metals is a, a LSP server for Scala, its client, so it works great, especially in small applications. In big applications, it kind of struggles sometimes, and I have to restart. But uh, I try to use it less in big applications. Um, but yeah, basically I try to use only, uh, it, it works like go to definition and stuff or, or see the type signatures of methods or functions. Uh, so yeah, that's the tool hope that answers the questions. Uh, so we were here, right? We have the main entry point and <laughs> hello James. Uh, got some friends joining the stream. Um, right here's the the main entry point and let's look into into all the packages and let's see what what every component does and what is the role in the application um, so in order to understand 
all the components we need to start in the main entry point here. The first thing we do, well, we get an implicit logger, which this comes from the log for cuts library. And, <clears throat> and the first thing we do here is load in the configuration and the configuration, you'll find it here. We have um, an enumeration there for different environments. Here's an example with two different environments. Have a bunch of types here. Um, and this is something new uh, also in, in second edition. We use uh, the revo, I mentioned it before. This does type class derivation for us. And you can also use it with a new type library to create new types. My favorite combination of refined types with new type, it's something I'll never give up. <laughs> And I know this is hard um, if you plan to migrate to Scala tree because there's no uh, support for macro annotations as far as I know. Um, so yeah, but in the short term, at least myself, I don't plan to migrate yet. It's, uh, so that's why I decided just, I think Scala 2 is gonna be around, especially in companies uh, for a while. Uh, whatever is working in Scala 2, people are not going to migrate it to Scala 3 and so on. So I think it's still quite helpful. And whatever you learn in this book, anyway, will be quite helpful in Scala 3 too, e even though like the syntax changes a little bit. Um, but yeah, here's the, the configuration uses the series library. Uh, you can go here, see uh, series basically promotes this uh, configuration as code. Um, it's uh, built on top of cats effect as well, supports cats effect tree. So it's updated in the, in the latest version. And yeah, this is very much explained in the book, but it's pretty trivial to use it. You can read uh, environment variables, system properties, or even default values like we have here, right? Because this is what the, the library promotes. It's basically some um, configuration as code. And you can do all uh, depending on the environment you are, you can you can retrieve different different values, right? If you are in the test environment, you, here's an example. Like you can just run it as localhost. Otherwise, in production, you have some specific IP address or specific URL. And yeah, so that's the configuration. What else? How do we continue? Um, uh, we basically log that we loaded the configuration. And then we create a supervisor. Supervisor is something new, comes from Cat's Effect, and it basically allows you to to run uh, in in the same way you do. Uh, you start a, a, a process in a different in a different context, like asynchronously. When via start, you can do the same, but via the supervisor to make sure that when the application shuts down, there are no dead threads over there. Like everything is supervised by a unique fiber. And so all the fibers are basically canceled. There's a question about series. Um, can you provide, uh, I guess, as dash D options? I guess those are options of the ShaBM or system properties. Uh, probably yes, but I'm not, not sure if I understood the question. Uh, but yeah, let me know. Um, so app resources is next. This is something that basically abstracts over the things that are resources in the application. So we have an HTTP client. This is this comes from uh, HTTP for us, and we have uh, a Postgres client, which is uh, confusingly represented as a resource of session. Um, the reason is because uh, it, it's basically a pool of sessions, so we represent it as a resource. Um, and, and Redis commands, which is basically the interface behind the, the Redis for Cats library. Uh, so everything, it's, uh, it requires um, a resource which uh, forms a monad so we can compose them together. Um, so where is it? Yeah, here's how we compon uh, compose everything. Uh, basically, we create the, the client. We, we did, in this case, we are using the Ember client. And we create the Postgres uh, connection here. And see, via eval tap, in this case, uh, we, we run a check on the connection 
to make sure that whenever we start up our application, there are there are connection checks. So ma make sure that our our connection to Postgres, our connections to Redis, uh, are valid, and and then we combine everything via Parmap N. And yeah, Parmap N, and that's how we compose all the resources because the creation of resources is usually effectful, uh, and and they have a life cycle, so they have to be managed in a different way. So when we compose the resources, all we do at the end is basically called use, and we share whatever uh, resources we need to share with the rest of applications. Well, what we do in this case is we do an eval map. On the, on the resources and we can we create the rest of the application um, so what is the rest of the application well we create the HTTP client services programs and HTTP API which is basically the the HTTP for a server and in the end we create the HTTP server uh, which is also using Ember Ember is also the, the new uh, the newest server and client uh, from HTTP for us um, and in the end we call use forever which is basically an alias for use and return never right so because it has to run it's a long running computation so this is gonna finish whenever uh, there is a failure the, the server shuts down or whenever <clears throat> whenever we hit control C let's say if we run it in the SPT in the SPT uh, session um, is there any reason? Is there any, is there a reason why seal abstract class is used over traits? Uh, yeah, well, you got your answer there. It's mentioned in chapter one. Um, if you didn't purchase the book, you can actually read it for free. Chapter one is available for free. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know if it's the entirety of chapter one, but at least most of it. And um, but the reason is. Where, where was that? I think it was in the configuration, right? Oh, no, in the resources. The resources. And it's also here. Yeah, so resources we use, uh, app resources, which is defined as a seal after class. This is basically to protect anyone from creating um, the application, and an abstract class doesn't have the copy method that the, the case class has. Uh, but yeah, the long explanation is in the book, so I encourage you to read it. At least chapter one, <laughs> and so continuing with the application, uh, there there are a few things that um, that we use a lot in the second edition. Basically, because it's it's not a, a a new pattern, it's not a new design. It's something quite old actually, but it's it's uh, actually like people are using it more and more. Uh, it's something that is called the we. They call it, or we call it now, the capability trait. Uh, FS2 is actually leveraging this in, in their API and a few others are following. So I figured that this would be a way of um, demonstrating how to use it with, with a few things. One is the uh, HTTP client and the other, the other one is the HTTP server. This is not strictly necessary. It's just here for demonstration purposes. We could basically create all of this directly in the app resources here but as you can see we we require different constraints here so the constraints we have are concurrent console logger make http client make redis and network right network i think comes from fs2 yeah fs2 ionet so it's basically another capability trait um or it's just um and so what we do well, it's not really. I mean, some I I I have seen some folks calling capability trait only whenever it's an effectful uh, thingy, like it could be in resource or in F. Um, but there's also um, like in this case, it, it could also be considered a type class instance because we can um, we can create um, and a default instance of make HTTP client for any async, like async is from cats effect tree. And, and so we have a, a default instance. So what, what this does is basically a, a redirection of the, of the effects constraint. So 
Um, by doing this, we avoid having hard constraints like async, and, and instead we have a simple constraint like make make HTTP client. So as I said, like here we could just uh, remove everything and basically add async, and it, it will probably work. Um, so this is just mainly as demonstration purposes. Uh, some people are asking to increase the font. I thought it was big enough, but yeah, apparently not. Uh, let me know if that's better. <clears throat> okay, so uh, next. Well, like all, all, all that you are seeing here in within this uh, eval map, it's um, uh, all the modules in the application that, that we can see here. Uh, basically, HTTP API, HTTP clients, program security services. Uh, and this is my favorite way of organizing uh, an application. And basically, uh, modularize your application uh, using basically traits and classes. Um, because HTTP, I mean, Scala is, is pretty good with handling classes and you know mixing functional programming and object or in programming. So I think creating classes and objects, it's pretty easy. So why not uh, taking advantage of it? So the HTTP API module takes uh, a bunch of dependencies, takes a few other modules as dependency, services, program security, and it creates all the middlewares that we've seen in the application. This is all for authentication. Uh, the authentication route, routes, the open routes, and a few others. And here we combine them all. And we combine the admin routes here and we use the router to basically add a prefix uh, slash admin to all the admin routes. Um, here we compose the middlewares, the ones that are, um, require HTTP routes and the ones that require HTTP app. And you can create your own middleware as well. Uh, in the end, we compose a single HTTP app uh, by combining all the middlewares together um, and all the routes. So that's basically an example of uh, HTTP for us. HTTP clients is pretty basic because we only have one single client. It's a payment client. And programs, we only have one, but it requires a, a little bit of configuration. Uh, we define a retry policy here. And, and this is our only program. Uh, I call programs basically anything that combines pure logic based on, on interfaces or tactless final al algebras and possibly other programs as well. Um, security, it's all related to the authentication tokens we create for the HTTP application and a few other things, but mainly all related to security, securing your application and services, and basically all the services they require uh, a few require Redis connection, a few other require a Postgres connection, and a few of them require both. I think, yeah, for example, well, the health check requires both because uh, basically we have an HTTP route for the health check that, that combines both uh, Postgres and Redis health and reports back. And <clears throat> Yeah, so, so what are the new things in the second edition? Uh, basically, in the domain type, we've seen how a few things are using uh, Derevo for uh, type class derivation. And this is like actually really nice. I really like this library. Um, basically, we can derive instances of Cersei, encoder, decoder, and a few instances of cats. For example, uh, the EQ instance, equality, and show, and there's UUID is something new, it's something custom that we have here. A query param is something also custom, which uh, is basically uh, HTTP for us. And whenever we want to define uh, manual JSON instances, we can do it manually always in the companion object. Uh, but let's look into, into these new things because uh, they are interesting. Um, type class derivation for query param is basically this. Uh, it, it derives a query param decoder and it only works for new types in this case. 
So if there is an instance for 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 non-empty string, then we can derive it. Um, the way it works is basically using this dummy trait, uh, which it only works for uh, for new types. Um, not going into details in the implementation, but basically, if you try to to use uh, this derivation on anything else that is not a new type, uh, this fails at compile time. And yeah, it, there are examples in the book, and you can you can see that yourself. Uh, there is a question. It says if the derived annotation it uh, could be used uh, with any other framework instead of cats, like if the project it's made in CO, um, and yeah, totally yes. Like this is unrelated to any uh, effect library. Um, this operates on on vanilla case classes, on vanilla classes as well, and it works well with new type. Uh, there's like you can see here this is like pure domain there's no mention of effects here um, uh, and it has integration with a bunch of libraries i know that it supports Cersei, cats uh, but if you want to support uh type class for other i don't know if ceo supports type classes uh, i don't think that it comes out of the box you probably have to do that yourself um, so we have a few extensions here. We, we can derive also a config decoder for series. Yeah, this is something we do in the configuration. Here we derive the config decoder here. So then we can basically load the configuration using our new types here. And this requires an instance of config decoder for the type. So we can derive that automatically using the derived annotation as well. Um, yeah, what else do we have here? And this is odd, all related to basically JWT tokens and and so on. It's our implementation details now. Very important. Ah, one thing that is um, very re relevant is like a different design that it, um, comp especially compared to the first edition, is that. Um, Instead of having uh, instances imported a la carte, we have basically all the all the type class instances that we we control that are basically that all these, these instances, for example, that we derive, uh, they are basically available on every companion object because that's how the the, the derivation works here. So this is. Uh, whenever we require the show instance for any of these types, uh, it's, it's going to be found because it's in the implicit scope of the companion object. But for types that we do not control, for example, um, types that are defined in other libraries, and we cannot add type class derivation to that, then we have orphan instances. So I decided to place them in the companion object of the, of the domain. So here we have all the orphan instances and basically everything that comes from third-party libraries we have no control over uh, everything is here so this is like one consistent way of dealing with orphan instances and i think it, it works pretty well the benefits and you know the pros and cons are also explained in the book um, and a few other things here we have yeah effects this one was present also in, in the first edition basically run stuff in the background um, we do it in this way for some reasons, uh, but uh, as you know, there is also uh, the background function directly supported by Cat's Effect Tree, but it returns the resource, and yeah, things has to be have to be implemented in a different way. So because it returns a resource, it could not be uh, a, a type class like in this case. So that's for that, that reason I decided to take an implicit supervisor, even though uh, it usually usually it's shared explicitly not implicitly but it's still valid in my opinion and yeah the reason behind this is also explained in the book uh, but if uh, there is a question i said what is an orphan instance an orphan instance is basically instances that that instances for types that come from uh from a, a third-party library 
Um, but sometimes an orphan instance could be, uh, let's say, uh, let's say that this third party library defines uh, an instance for, for a type class, but then we define another one because we want it to work in a different way. Then that also is an orphan instance because we want to, we don't care about the one that exists in the library, we want to overwrite that. And that is an orphan instance. But in this case, it is also an orphan instance because it is not defined in by the type or by the library itself, but we define it because it doesn't exist anywhere else. Hope that answered the question. And yeah, a few other effects, basically uh, generating UUIDs, um, basically just to, you know, it's very, very simple way. There's also a library by Chris Davenport called FUUID, which you can check out as well. Uh, but you, I, I, I like my, <clears throat> this was a, a very, very simple interface to create, create and read UUIDs, so you can see it's only a couple of lines. Um, uh, when it's such a small thing, sometimes you need to consider also whether you want to depend on a third-party library because of binary compatibilities and whenever you want to upgrade your system, um, it's uh, yeah, it's something that you need to consider. You know, bringing more third-party libraries makes your project more complex. Uh, Uh, here's another one, very simple, like uh, abstracts over Java time clock. Um, this is also very, very specific to dealing with JWT tokens. These are all the extension stuff. And yeah, a few custom instances for refine, also explained in the book. A few convenient syntax methods that we use in, in, the, in the HTTP routes. <coughs> Uh, what else do we have here? Okay, modules, we've seen it, optics, this is something a little bit fancy, <laughs> but it's basically just uh, um, something that we could use as a type class so we can derive, um, we can derive the um, UUID type for, for any, any of the domain types that, uh, that wrap over a UUID, like this one, right? So we can use UUID here. But this one wraps a string, so if we try to derive it for this one, then this one won't, won't work. Well, I don't know if the compiler is working in real time here. Yeah, it does, right? So it doesn't work here. Uh, but it works whenever you you have a new type that extends, that wraps a new UID. Um, so yeah, that's the reason of this one. Uh, programs is basically just to check out. This is like the, the logic of the program. Uh, the retry logic um, <clears throat> yeah you'll see in the application that we have a bunch of retry code here uh, this is basically the implementation of uh, cuts retry uh, the cuts retry library because there is no um, there is no um, there is no no version for cuts effect tree yet it's not it hasn't been published uh, yeah I'll, I I was thinking about helping for a while but being busy with work and with life and yeah hopefully uh, but this should be av available soon at some time I guess um, uh, but this should, this is basically part of an external library it's some, some code I copied from this library so I could make the, the project work but it's not code that I that I have written it's basically copy paste with the permission of Chris the author of the library uh, so thanks Chris and yeah, resources, retries, and this is something specific to the application. It's basically, we have a few things that are retriable, and so I try to model there with a the, with the simple ADT, uh, orders and payments, something that could, we could retry, and, and we have a, an interface here, or some kind of like type, type class that abstract over the retrying logic, and we have a, an instance for any logger and temporal, and <clears throat> yeah, this is something used by, by the checkout here. You can see we have uh, this type class constraints here, background, logger, mono throw, and retry. So we can compose our, we can write our own, the whole logic with this con these four constraints. Um, and that's, that's the checkout process. 
Uh, what else do we have? The rest are the, what do we have? Here are some codecs. This is basically all related to Skunk, the, the Postgres library for, you know, we define codecs uh, for our new types. We don't do type class derivation here because codecs are not type classes. These are just pure values in, in Skunk, so it's kind of like a different approach to Doobie. Um, and it works well as well. Finally, the services is where we make use of Postgres and Redis. So we have the authentication, uh, the authentication auth interface here. This one uses Redis, you know, creates token and usernames and passwords. And brands uses Postgres. So this is like an example of using Skunk. And here we define a bunch of codecs and a bunch of queries and commands. So select, select all, insert. And there are a few more complex here, I think in items. Yeah, so there's a few queries. We just write the raw SQL, but it's, um, it is all compared at runtime with uh, whatever decoders and encoder, uh, encoders you define. So if you are expecting a new ID here, then that should be uh, a new UID in, in your decoder, right? So this is is a new UID. Yeah, you can see that it's UUID comes from comes from skunk and we basically map over our new type. <coughs> there are a few questions. Um, When we use Java libraries in some Scala project, how can we say the project is pure functional because Java libraries may have implementation using VARs, etc. Assume Skunk is in production ready, maybe. Okay, the two different questions. The first one, when you use Java libraries, um, if you know that uh, Java library, the Java library is basically doing, doing uh, mutations or side effects, then that's something that needs to be suspended. That's why we use uh, cuts effect for that. Basically, whatever it's called to Java land, we suspend it in 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 IO or in, in you know the equivalent in in the type class land like sync async. We do a delay there, um, and yeah, that's what, what that's how you deal with Java stuff or any other Scala libraries that are not functional. Um, and. Yeah, that's, that's how you, you keep your application functional. Like, and if you are not sure whether your Java library is doing mutation or side effects, then wrap it. Wrap it in, 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 in IO or in F delay, just in case, because you never know what, whatever a Java library does deep down. And you can see that with many, many functional libraries in Scala. For example, Redis for Cuts is basically a, a functional wrapper over, over the Lettuce library is a Java Redis client. So all it does is basically wrap around it, convert the features to, to IO or to F in cat's effect. And that's how you keep your code in functional land. Uh, but inter interoperation with Java is pretty straightforward. Usually the only gotcha so far are the, you know, dealing with uh, const the, the execution context sometimes. Uh, but I think Cuts Effect 3 does a much better work at that. In Cuts Effect 2, we had to shift manually things. Also, integration in Cuts Effect 3 is much better. You have integration, like you can convert com completable features, Java features, and it, it works out of the box. We don't need to think about all this stuff. Um, another question, assume Skunk isn't production ready yet. Well, if you ask the author, Rob Norris, he'll probably tell you that, I don't know, I consider it production ready because I've been using it in production for a year and it works and it's great. It's non-blocking, asynchronous. Uh, you don't have to deal with all that shady VC stuff. Um, so I recommend it, uh, but it depends on your use case. You probably want, if you want a battle tested library, Doobie is being deployed in production for, yeah, for years. Uh, but uh, my belief is that Skunk is going to replace it eventually and I, I've been using it in production, I can give you, um, that's, that's what I can say. Okay, 
Um, another thing that I added here is basically how to, uh, there's an example uh, pretty de detailed in the book. Uh, this is something um, that I'm not using, we are not using in the application, but that, that's what it has this comment here is an example of transaction the transactions but it's not using the application basically using SQL uh, Postgres SQL tra transactions uh, all together so we want to let's say we want to insert a brand the category and an item um, so we, we can use this uh, session dot transaction dot surround surround is basically uh, perform an effect uh, because this is a resource so surround is a new method on resource in case you haven't seen it it's basically this, right? Use, ignoring the input and confirm the, the effect. Um, so yeah, this is it. I think it's a, it's a very simple but a useful example of transactions that some people might be uh, Some, uh, some explanations on the chat at the moment about um, yeah mutation mutable bar bars and and stuff and some uh, comments in Spanish as well gracias Alvaro <laughs> and yeah so that's an overall uh, view of the project and I can show you uh, yeah, we can run it, for example, here. Uh, let's try to make this bigger. We can compile it and we can run the unit test as well. Uh, we do that. We have a bunch of unit tests. Uh, you see, this is the output generated by, by Weaver. So Weaver is the test framework we use in the second edition. It supports cuts effect out of the box, so we don't have to um, to think about you know converting effects and dealing with different libraries, we use a single one and it does the work. It supports multiple multiple uh, effect libraries, um, and yeah, it's super recommended. Uh, we use it extensively. It supports cuts effect resources as well to share resources. It even supports global resources, um, and, and and actually the, the the output is quite great whenever it fails. Um, so it's something I recommend. These are the unit tests, but we can also run the uh, the integration test. Uh, but to run the integration test, we need to we need to start um, Postgres and Redis. Let's do that. So here uh, we have a Docker Compose file that actually defines Postgres and Redis. So if we start both both services, then we can run the integration test. Thing. I can't remember the syntax in, yeah, I think it's this, in, in the new SVT versions. So before it was IT colon test. I think that's deprecated now. Um, Yeah, this uh, this is the the integration test uh, suite. We have a uh, one for Redis, one for Postgres, and this is something we can see. Uh, we can see now. We can start with the Redis one. Uh, this is using um, Weaver as the test framework, and this hits Redis and and Postgres. Well, this one is only for Redis, but we have another one for for Postgres directly. We basically create the real things, uh, we create the connection to Redis and <laughs> Salar is asking why I'm not using Nix to start Postgres and Redis directly. All for some things, um, you know, the, the rest of the people are not using Nix <laughs> and uh, Docker Compose is actually pretty, pretty useful for starting Docker and Redis and whatever you want to declare there. Uh, I'm not a purist on, on Nix. Uh, I think yeah, both uh, Docker, Compose, and Nix have their place in the world. Uh, some things are better. Uh, yeah, this is super simple using Docker Compose, so uh, stick with it. 
Um, so yeah, this is Weaver. Uh, this is something called a resource suite. Um, uses Weaver, Scala check, and Weaver. Um, <clears throat> and it has a few things that I define. Just trying to come up with the before all, after all, and just for fun, trying to do this uh, test after each, before each. Um, just to explain how we can replace the the imperative before each or before all and after all just by using cat's effect resource. Um, so with some, some syntax here, which is awesome. Um, so here is what we have, integration tests. Uh, what else do we have here? In the test we have, well, the interpreters. We have the, the checkout suite. Um, these are all the unit tests that you can see whenever we, we hit run here. Um, we can also do test only and run the checkout suite. I think that should work. Yeah. And yeah, unit test and something interesting we do in this second edition is also we are testing um, some of the orphan instances that we define. So for example, we, we do law testing, like we test all the monolith tests because we define a custom a custom instance for money. Remember we do it here. Uh, the main package, yeah, we do it here. We have a money monolith here, this one. So this is something we need to law test. Another one. Here we have a few other instances as well. Um, so this is an, an example of how easy it is to, to do a law test whenever we define custom instances. And we do testing of the HTTP client, which is um, it's awesome that you can create just a client uh, from an HTTP app. So in this case, it's this we define a custom. HTTP app just for, for testing and we can use that as a client using client from HTTP app. It does exactly what it promises and it, it, it's great for testing. So that's pretty much everything about tests. We have also test of routes, HTTP routes and yeah, there's a question. Uh, how about some distributed transaction? Oh, that was a question for the one before. Um, so we have transaction items. Well, um, I, it depends on what, what you really mean with distributed transaction. Um, uh, like when you're running this application, you're running in the context of this application. If you have this application, there are multiple instances of the same application, the thing changes, uh, uh, distributed, distributed systems are more complex inherently uh, so you probably need some kind of orchestrations you need to run the transactions uh, coordinate that transaction uh, let's say with Redis or with PostgreSQL directly or maybe you will have some kind of uh, messaging broker uh, in the middle so you, your different instances are kind of like stateless and the state lives somewhere else uh, basically doing distributed systems is basically keeping trying to keep the state in a single place and and with the rest of the of the services or the components in in, in the system making trying to make the, them stateless or read only at least and one of the nodes has has to be the coordinator but yeah, it goes far beyond uh, what this application does um, uh, so yeah, we've been like almost an hour here. Um, before I forget, you guys, thank you for joining. Uh, there is a coupon available for any one of you who want to buy the book, who haven't purchased the book yet. And yeah, that's the one. It's valid until, it's valid until to tomorrow, I think. Yeah, until tomorrow, it expires tomorrow. It, it, it's valid for, for the whole day tomorrow as well. Um, it's a 20% discount on the book. So just as a token of gratitude for joining this live stream, 
and yeah hopefully you enjoyed the the book um, and I'd be happy to to answer any questions if you have like um, remember there is still a guitar channel I know the the community has moved over to discord now but if you want to use uh, I mean there is still this guitar channel called uh, functional uh, it's called PFP Scala community here yeah so someone here was kind enough to announce the stream <laughs> So yeah, if you ask any question, I, I always try to, you know, time to time check this, this Gitter channel. But if it's not me, there is always uh, someone that's ready to help. And yeah, make sure you join the, the, the Gitter channel. I'd be happy to help. Um, yeah, thank you all for, for joining the stream. And, and okay. Uh, there are some questions, so I'm trying to read. Um, uh, there is a question for for the equivalent Haskell project. Um, yeah, like this question refers to this project, which is um, the shopping cart uh, version for Haskell. Is this one here? But it hasn't been updated in a long time. You see, like the commits are like longer than a year ago so I need to get back to it and try to update it to match the second edition uh, and some people try to yeah to compile or run this application they maybe run into issues uh, with some libraries uh, yeah feel free to ping me in the guitar channel try to help you I haven't run this application in a long time so maybe there's a missing library now um, uh, but I'll try to help you out in the guitar channel please uh, oh Francis uh, thanks for joining even if it's late this uh, live recording is gonna be on YouTube anyway you can watch it anytime um, someone is requiring another book <laughs> uh, we'll see about that uh, I was planning to write another book on uh, on event driven applications basically um, something similar to what I'm doing at work right now like a stateless most of them are stateless services and managed by a messaging broker like Kafka. In, at work, we use Apache Pulsar. And it, it's a really completely different ki kind of application because everything uh, e everything flows around Pulsar. So Pulsar is basically the messaging broker and that's where all the state lives. We communicate. Uh, via messages, we use WebSockets as well. It's a super interesting project, and I think I had this this idea for a while. I started writing a draft, but writing a book is a lot of work, and having another uh, full time job, it's really hard to find the time. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's someday, but uh, no promises for now. And uh, yeah, thanks, thank you all for joining in, and hope you enjoyed the the presentation and. Uh, you know where to find me. <laughs> Bye.